We are now continuing with porting games to virtual re reality. Please welcome Palmer L Lucky from Oculus VR. You're the first, by the way. What? <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to thank Michael and thank Valve for inviting us to be here. It's a huge honor. Valve has one of the best VR teams in the world, and we definitely wouldn't be where, they, where we are without them. So let's give them a round of applause. I also want to thank anyone who's supported us, especially the people who backed our Kickstarter. It's, you know, we, wouldn't, we also wouldn't be here without your help, too. So, today I'm going to be talking about porting games to VR, some of the challenges, some of the good things, mostly about the challenges. Like Abrash, we believe that consumer virtual reality is coming, and that it's coming fairly soon. Virtual reality is kind of like a black hole, and we're a spaceship. We're crossing an event horizon. Pretty soon, we're all going to get sucked in, and nobody's going to escape. It's, <laughs> it's not a matter of if consumer virtual reality coming. It's all a matter of when. And if some of you might have already seen Valve's VR demo, probably not enough of you, and it's probably the best consumer virtual reality system in the world right now. Uh, we want to deliver that caliber of experience with the consumer rift, and we think that we have a really good shot of doing it. But Consumer virtual reality isn't going to be defined just by all of the hardware specifications that Michael was talking about. It's going to be de defined by the kind of experiences that developers make for virtual reality that maximize the potential of virtual reality. The kind of experiences that brilliant developers like you will make for people like me. <laughs> so the first thing to talk about importing content to virtual reality. We've done a lot of work building content internally, helping port games internally, and working with hundreds of external developers to make their games work with VR. And the biggest takeaway that you can come away from this talk with is that porting content to virtual reality doesn't usually work. <laughs> and you know, I, I want to say that there are exceptions to this rule. Some, thing, some games do move over to VR reasonably well and can provide a novel experience, a cool experience, maybe even an experience that was better than it was on a PC. But they're definitely not going to be the kind of experiences that define VR as a platform. Um, this is really not different than any kind of platform, whether it's a console or a mobile or a motion gaming. Let's take mobile for an example. The best games on mobile are the ones that were designed with the platform in mind, not the console ports that were ported to a mobile device. These games were originally designed with physical controls and a large screen in mind. Putting virtual controls onto a screen doesn't work. Uh, one of my examples is Street Fighter IV. I love that game. I love it on PC. But it is not a very good translation to a mobile device. And even if you can get a game working reasonably well on a mobile device coming from another platform, it's never going to be as good as it was if it had been designed with VR in mind from the start. So the question is, what should we build? I think that virtual reality is going to be defined by the experiences that are impossible on any other platform. A lot of, P of game can be a great PC game. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a great VR game. And it goes both ways. A great VR game is not necessarily going to be a PC, great PC game. The strengths and limitations of every platform are always going to shine through. So what should we be building? I've tried to figure out how I should kind of frame this, because there's a whole bunch of different things governing what works well in VR, and we don't have all the answers. Um, for the sake of this presentation today, I'm going to do something really corny. We're going to found a VR game company together, everybody in this room, Steam Dev Days VR Games LLC. And we're going to pretend that we're making a VR game, that we want to make a really great VR game that really takes advantage of the safest things in VR that we know will work. And I actually have a picture of all of the co-founders with me today. <laughs> <laughs> and so we need to get started. A quick disclaimer. We don't have all the answers yet. I don't have all the answers yet. And you don't have all of the answers yet. Virtual reality is still completely untapped. And like Michael said, the person who figures out how to best leverage all of these strengths into a game like Doom that defines the genre is going to be in a very good place. And they're going to be remembered for a very long time. We can't possibly go through what's everything that's going to make a good VR game, but we're going to go some of the things that we know are a safe bet for making something today. So design session number one. First thing we need to do is stop porting our existing games. Uh, you know, it's tempting. 
here at SDD VR Games LLC, we have a long, long, you know, history of varied IP, and we have all these games we've built, we support them, we have customers. How great would it be if we could take those games and we could just make them into VR games, port it straight over? The problem is that VR games are not just about wide field of view and head tracking added to, added to a game that has mechanics that were made for a fundamentally different system. The best way to think about porting games to VR is not to think how you could shoehorn an existing title into VR. It's to think about what, if anything, you can reuse in a new type of experience. The Valve hardware is actually a pretty good example. If you've tried their demo, there are a lot of assets in it that come from existing Valve projects, but the actual game, if you will, the, the core mechanics were not pulled from an existing PC title because it was completely designed from the ground up to work well in VR. So something that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to experiment and prototype and iterate. And that's important for any kind of game design, not just for virtual reality, but especially for virtual reality, it's important. If you go down the wrong path in development on a PC game, most of the time what's going to happen is you'll have a little bit less fun than you had before. In virtual reality, you can make your users very uncomfortable very easily if you don't act carefully. And so you want to build any idea that you have, not in your head, but in a game and try that in VR as early and as often as possible. And that's important if we want to make sure that our game is comfortable. And I think that VR games do need to be comfortable. A lot of what we're seeing right now are with existing ports coming to VR is experiences that really are not that comfortable. I wish I could come up here and say every game is going to be great in VR, but it's just not the case. And even some of those games are some of my favorite games. If a game isn't a comfortable experience for everybody, everybody and not just oh, my game's pretty comfortable if you've played hundreds of hours of VR and you've adapted like Palmer has. It needs to be something that anybody can play because they're not always going to blame it on us and blame it on VR. They could end up blaming it on your game and nobody wants that on them. One thing that we want to be careful about is trying to minimize vestibular mismatch or at least minimizing the impacts of vestibular mismatch. Uh, Michael talked about some of these th key things in achieving presence and a lot of it does go to having accurate head tracking optic accurate optical calibration, uh, low latency hardware, high performance software, and carefully designed content. But even once you have all these things, once you have a sense of presence, you can still have very strong vestibular mismatch that causes discomfort in users. And designing games in VR is largely going to revolve around that problem. Locomotion in particular is really hard. It's actually one of the reasons that ports fundamentally often don't work very well. Let's go over a few things really fast. One, expected motions are always better than unexpected motions. How many people get sick when they ride along in a car sometimes? Sometimes a few people. How many of those people put your hand down if you don't get sick when you drive a car? Okay, see, there, okay, okay, there's a few of you. Whoa, you get sick driving? Uh, but for most of you, it's when you're in control of your own destiny of going down the highway, you're not likely to get sick. And it's often the same in virtual reality. Uh, when we were doing work porting Unreal Tournament to virtual reality, one of the biggest problems was that when you get hit by a rocket, you would either get thrown through the air or slid along the ground very unexpectedly and very rapidly. That made people more uncomfortable than almost anything else in the entire game. Anytime you move the user in an unexpected way, you run a risk of making them feel disoriented. Um, one unintuitive thing that we found out, and this isn't to completely proven, this is just what we've found so far, we thought early on, how can we make movement in, uh, in locomotion in VR more comfortable? If you're you know, sitting in a chair and you're actually just using a gamepad, you've got this mismatch between what your vestibular system is saying that you're doing and what your eyes are telling you you're doing. We thought, well, one way that we could do that would be to smooth out all of the acceleration so that it takes you a while to get up to speed. Turns out that that was completely wrong. And even though it's maybe more, it's more unrealistic, it seems to be better to actually minimize the duration of acceleration, not the magnitude of acceleration. Um, we look forward to seeing what you guys mess around with, especially around that. Also, forward movement is very comfortable. Um, in general, in terms of locomotion in VR, if you are locomoting, um, moving to the side is not very comfortable. It's not something we do in everyday life, and we also don't run backwards very often. It's not something safe. And that's a problem when you're talking about games that's fundamental mechanics revolves around, I'm going to walk into a room, and then I'm going to run backwards, taking out all of my enemies. That's a big problem. And I can't wait till someone makes a game, by the way, where you chase people forwards. That's going to be a lot better for VR. There's not many games like that. <laughs> um, 
And if you design a game for VR from the ground up, you can take these into account. You can take these kinds of movements that work, what doesn't, and make a great game around it. If you have a game like Quake, Quake relies on being able to move backwards very quickly, sideways very quickly, forward very quickly, and snap changing in all of your directions. It's probably not going to be a good VR experience. Or if you change it to be a good VR experience, the experience will be so fundamentally altered that you probably shouldn't be calling the game Quake anymore. So we're targeting a seated experience. There's multiple reasons for this. I would like to walk around a lot like in the Valve demo. Um, it's easier to make the tracking technology. There's liability reasons. You're wearing a cord. You don't want to trip and fall. Um, but we're targeting a seated experience. And because of that, some of the most reliably comfortable things that we've seen have not been first-person shooters or games where you have a body locomoting through space independently of your real body sitting in a chair. They've been games that are either where you're standing still or relying on the user sitting in a chair. A great example would be uh, Eve Valkyrie, where you're in a spaceship and you're sitting in a chair that looks kind of a lot like your desk chair. And even though your ship is moving, you still have that fixed frame of reference around you. And that does seem to help a lot with simulator sickness. Avoid exhausting head movement. We really, in this game we want to make, we need to avoid exhausting head movement. It's really tempting because virtual reality gives you this ability now to look everywhere, not just forward and not to have to consciously move your view. Um, some games try, that we've seen try to take advantage of that to the extreme and put targets over here and targets over there where you need to be constantly moving your head. The problem is that constant 360 degree movement makes for strong necks and tired players. And so what we've tried to do in a lot of our content is we, you always want there to be something to look at. Uh, but we don't want to force people to look at it. Uh, like when we were helping to port Hawken over to virtual reality, early on, the back of the cockpit, well, early on there was no back of the cockpit, but when there was a back of the cockpit, it was uh, just untextured gray. And you'd look around and you'd say, wow, this is a really not very realistic cockpit. You want there to be something to look at, but you also wouldn't want to put your damage indicators behind your head where you're going to have to look at them all the time. It might make for interesting impressions or showing off what VR can do, and it will definitely make for good videos where people are saying, wow, I'm playing this game and it's so good, but it's not going to make for a good gameplay experience. <laughs> Don't force people to use their head more than they want to. Something else that we need to be aware of is having all of our content being rendered at the correct scale in real-world units. Or if not the correct scale, at least be aware of the scale we are rendering at. This is another big issue that it comes with porting content. Games that are made for a monitor, most of the time the assets are not at the right content. There are exceptions like iRacing, your simulation title. Everything was meant, all of the tracks are laser scanned to a few millimeters. They're super precise. All of the models are life-size. But most games, the doorways are clipping through your head, the tables are at chest level, and light bulbs, for some reason, seem to always be sized like grapefruits. And you might not notice that on a monitor, but in VR, even the most, any player is going to be able to see it. They're going to look at that light bulb and say, that's a grapefruit. And, you know, it might be easy to shoot it or something, but it's not good in VR. Um, the reason I say that you doesn't always have to be necessarily correct, but that you should be aware of it, is that because some games do take advantage of the strong sense of scale. Um, there are some games where you play as very, very small characters. Other games where you're a giant looking down at a scene. Those are obviously cases where you don't have realistic scale, but at least you're aware of the scale. You're aware of what you want everything in the environment to be. It's critical that you make sure that everything is at whatever scale you want it to be. Everything we build is going to require head tracking. Uh, there are exceptions to this rule, like maybe you want to have a targeting reticle stuck to your head or a small information display stuck to your head. But in general, menus, cutscenes, heads-up displays, you don't want large things stuck to your face. What we uh, say in Oculus is fixed in space, not stuck to your face. And <laughs> it, there's no real equivalent for a large image being stuck directly to your face in the real world. We don't, th most people, who haven't played VR games that have poor menus, have never actually experienced anything like this. And it makes a lot of people pretty uncomfortable. Um, this is especially true for cutscenes. The best way to do cutscenes in VR is generally to stay in-game and look around kind of like Half-Life 2. If you have to use pre-done cutscenes, traditional cutscenes, it's best to make them as a floating window in space. Um, doing things like wrapping the entire view around you, or worse, just having it stuck on your head so that it moves when you look around, it's, almost gonna make, it's gonna make almost everyone uncomfortable. Um, this goes for UI in the games. Some of the best ways we've seen of putting, if, of putting UI in VR games has been things like uh, 
suppose that we're making a first-person shooter. It makes sense to put an ammunition counter on the gun, or if we have a menu, to put that on a display screen in the environment. What we definitely don't want to do is have things... Oh, man, five. We need to move on. AR stale UI is another way that you can handle this. And it doesn't have to be necessarily movie style AR where it's crazy glowing things. It could be a reasonable context for a lot of games. For example, if you're playing a game like Skyrim, there's no reason you couldn't have a magical floating UI to manage your inventory. A lot of these UIs that we've seen over the years in movies, they're actually pretty reasonable to do it in VR. And in fact, if you're interested in AR research and development, even if VR you just don't care about it, it's worth mentioning that VR is a good way to prototype AR types of experiences, because right now we don't have any AR hardware that's wide field of view with any good head tracking. <laughs> Players should have avatars. Um, I'm going to pick on Skyrim again. Skyrim, you have these beautiful arms, these forearms, where you can put different armor on them, you're shooting different magic out of them, you have all kinds of different weapons, but they're just arms. If you look down, you have no feet, you have no legs, you have no body, you don't even have any shoulders, and that can be a little bit depressing. So you're really, <laughs> in Skyrim, you're actually playing as a disembodied pair of forearms and an invisible head. <laughs> And that's a big problem in VR. You look down, you don't feel present in the scene. Uh, Valve did a really good job when they ported Team Fortress 2 to virtual reality, where you can look down and see a body. Now, it's not necessarily a you know, body that matches your own, but it's some kind of body, and it does make a huge difference in immersion. So if we're making a VR game, we definitely want to have a body, unless we're making a game that doesn't want a body, but that's a topic for another day with more than five minutes. Um, presence, I can't possibly cover it as well as Abrash talked about it in his talk. Um, but overall, it requires very low total motion to photons latency. So if we're making a game for VR, we're going to want to optimize for performance over visual fidelity. Now, that's not to say that we don't want our game to look good. Everyone wants their games to look good. But 1,000 thousand frames a second Minecraft VR is probably going to be a better VR experience than 30 FPS Battlefield VR. Um, if you don't have that strong sense of present, if you're not maintaining that threshold of feeling like you're inside the game, you're not getting any real benefit out of virtual reality. Now, what kind of performance threshold are we trying to hit? Bare minimum right now with our DK1, which is a very flawed piece of gear, primitive. <laughs> it's good, but primitive. 60 FPS V6 Stereo 3D. And this is tough enough for a lot of games. And many games are going to struggle to even hit this. But then look at the future. The future, you really want to have 120 frames a second, V-Sync Stereo 3D, ideal with super sampling and anti-aliasing. AMD and NVIDIA and Intel are going to be really happy people. Um, <laughs> Maybe not game designers so much. And we're working on a few things at Oculus that might lower those frame rate requirements, but nothing to announce and definitely nothing to rely on. Um, shout out to all the rendering engineers here. Stereoscoping rendering needs to be perfect, and that is really hard. I'm going to pick on Skyrim one more time. All of the shadows and reflections are done in a single pass right at screen depth, and if you translate that game into VR, it looks really, really bad. Um, that's, those are pretty major problems. There's more minor problems, like we even have an internal Unreal demo at Oculus where there's just birds flying in one eye. Most people don't notice, but we still need to get it fixed. Something to be aware of, um, you know, especially with things more minor than birds in the sky. Another thing, we need to nail the Oculus integration. One of the biggest things that we see people do is fail to do this. And it's not because they're dumb or anything. It's because it is, there are, it is tricky to get it working sometimes, especially if you're using an engine other than Unreal or Unity where we have pretty solid pre-built engine integrations. Um, but no matter how fast performing our game is, no matter how much we've optimized our UI, if you don't have correct uh, distortion or if you don't have correct head tracking, it's not going to be a comfortable experience. If you're having issues matching it up, the best thing we can do is not to try and warp your game and warp its field of view to try and make it so that it looks about right. It's to figure out why it didn't look right in the first place. Um, so if you do have trouble with that, contact us at Oculus because we help a lot of people with it. That's probably one of the things that we help with the most. Abrash also talked about this. It's I, I totally agree is that multiplayer is amazing in VR. Being able to look someone face to face, eye to eye, whether it's real, not, not eye, real eye tracking, but simulated eye tracking. Um, oh, I wish I could talk about this. But the cool thing about simulated eye tracking is it doesn't have to be actually what you're doing, it just has to be a probable action. Um, being able to be face to face with people in a virtual environment, feeling as if you're present in the same space with them, is not possible with any other technology. And I think that's going to have impacts not just on gaming or VR gaming, but on the way that everyone communicates. Everyone uses Facebook, and that's a broken, crippled version of how we communicate in real life. And we still use it because it's more convenient. It lets us do it over a long, you know, long distances, and we can be whoever we want to be. If we can have all those benefits in VR with the additional benefits of real life talking to each other, I think a lot of people are going to spend a lot of time in VR chat. So. 
What types of games are going to be best to build in VR? I don't think right now, knowing what we know, that it's a first-person shooter. Um, someone in this audience is probably going to make a VR first-person shooter, and it's going to be great, and I look forward to playing it. But right now, if we're making a game for VR, we probably need to rethink the kinds of interactions we're going to have. Um, they're going to be more up close. They're probably not go the safest thing to do is not to have lots of locomotion around a wide area. It's going to be in a small area. I think that the first people to pull off a really compelling game that takes advantage of everything that you can do in VR, the social presence, um, the ability to talk to people and feel as if you're actually there, first person to pull off a game like that, um, with <laughs> to pull that off in a game as compelling as Hearthstone or The Sims is going to have a lot of players and a lot of money. And you know, Michael said they're going to be remembered for a long time. But right now, we have not seen this VR killer app, but I think that we're going to see, be seeing it pretty soon. So, like I said earlier, we've been doing this for a really long time, well, more than a year. And <laughs> we, we've, we've been putting everything that we've learned into a best practices guide. It's by no means perfect, and it's always growing, especially we're soliciting people who can help us. In fact, if you want to do this, I can't match uh, Steam's earlier offer, but if you refer anybody to Oculus, I'll personally buy you any one game on Steam. <laughs> and, <laughs> So we're always trying to expand this guide, and it's a really good guide that goes over everything we've learned in VR, and I, probably some of it is incorrect, but we'd like your feedback. And if anyone in this room is interested at all in developing VR content, it's definitely a must read. So VR is still primitive, like I say, especially right now the hardware is primitive, but we're already able to do things that no other hardware in the world can do. And I think that's really important. It's never been possible, not just with gaming, but with any medium, to make people feel truly immersed in an environment. Personally, as a VR nut, I think that virtual reality is the most important technology in the history of humanity. If you don't believe that, and you probably don't, you'll probably at least agree that it's a pretty cool technology. Um, I think that the people in this room are going to be some of the people that create the experiences that redefine the way that we play games and interact forever. I can't wait. Thank you.